Hi everyone, I'm Scott Guang from the Aerospace Department. Today I want to present my recent work on learning Nash equilibria by policy approximation. To quickly motivate our work, we are living in a multi-agent world. In soccer, two teams of players compete against each other. In workspace, we need to collaborate. To resolve a traffic jam, coordination is needed. And the examples go on. In a competitive setting, like in soccer, we want to learn the best strategy against the opponent. A common solution concept for a competitive game is the Nash equilibrium, where the agents are best responding to each other's policy. However, equilibria are expensive to learn since one needs to somehow guess or reason what the opponent is thinking and doing. A natural question is then, can we use some cheap approximations to reason during the learning process? We address the competition issues in multi-agent learning through a learning fast and slow idea. Humans have two thinking modules. The first one is a fast, instinctive, and emotional module. The second one is slower, more deliberative, and more logical. This motivated us to propose our algorithm SNQ2, or Soft Nash Q2, that also has two modules. The first one is a cheap, fast, but inaccurate module. It uses entropy regularized policy to approximate the Nash policies. This module is used at every learning step to update the Q function. The second module is exact, but slow and expensive. It generates Nash policies to guide the fast module. Since this slow module is expensive to operate, we only use it periodically. We show that under mod assumptions, SNQ2 converges to a Nash equilibrium. Since balancing the fast and slow modules usage is essential to the performance of the algorithm, we provided a dynamic schedule to decide when to activate the slow module. We tested SNQ2 in game scenarios of different sizes and different stochasticity. We compared the performance with different algorithms, notably the minimax Q algorithm, which always uses a slow module mentioned earlier to update its Q function. Minimax Q also has theoretical guarantees of conversion to a Nash equilibrium. From figure 1, we can see that SNQ2 achieved the same level of convergence as minimax Q. Note that SRPS, or sequential rock, paper, scissor, has a uni uniform Nash equilibrium in every state, which shows that SNQ2 is capable of conversion to a mixed Nash equilibrium. From figure 2, we see a significant reduction in computation time. From figure 3, we terminate the algorithms at given cutoff time. We can see that SNQ2 has better performance at the cutoff. The fast module of SNQ2 can also be warm started with previous experience, or PE. We can see that warm starting does give a better performance. Finally, we present two convergence trends, episode-wise and time-wise. Figure 4 shows that even though approximations are used in SNQ2, episode-wise convergence trend is still similar to minimax Q, which always uses an exact update rule. Figure 5 shows a significant speed up com comparing with minimax Q. Warm starting with previous experience is marking gray in figure 4, and we can see that warm starting does enable better performance. Finally, in figure 4, dynamic scheduling, or DS is marked in red, provides better convergence comparing with the fixed schedule in green. If you are interested to know more about SNQ2, the preprint is available on archive, and please feel free to contact me through email. Thank you very much for your time. Hello everyone, I'm Rahul Singh, along with my advisor Dr. Yongshin Shen. We will be presenting our work on inference of collective Gaussian hidden Markov models. In this work, we propose an algorithm for inference from aggregate data generated by a large population of individuals. For example, in bird migration analysis, we cannot keep track of each individual bird migrating from one geographical area to another. Instead, we can record the, num uh, the, the observations in terms of bird counts at geographical locations at different time steps. The traditional filtering algorithms such as Kahneman filter cannot be applied on such aggregate level data. The generative model used in our algorithm is Gaussian hidden Markov model which involves state variables x and observation variables o's. We have a total of m trajectories as compared to the traditional setting where, uh, where the filtering is performed over a single individual trajectory. And the goal of the aggregate filtering is to estimate the hidden state distributions at each time point. 
we call our algorithm collective gaussian forward backward algorithm which is a message passing type algorithm involving four kinds of messages forward backward upward and downward it has a two pass structure forward pass and backward pass in forward pass the message parameters are updated clockwise till the end in backward pass we start from the end of the graph and finish at the first variable here this forward pass and backward pass are updated alternatively until the convergence which is guaranteed and the marginal distribution parameters the mean and covariance can be found via these equations upon convergence for faster inference we also propose a sliding window filter which only takes previous k observations into account and the discarded information is encoded in terms of prior represented by the forward message parameters moreover in case of a single individual and a window size of 1 this reduces to the standard kalman filter to conclude my presentation we have proposed a filtering algorithm from aggregate data which we call collective gaussian forward backward algorithm we also propose a sliding window filter for faster inference which re reduces to the standard kalman filter thank you hello everyone my name is yurotsuki i am a phd student at cee and dr wang is my advisor in this presentation i am going to talk about finite element model updating of an 18 story structure using branch and band algorithm with epsilon constraint So what is finite element model updating? It refers to the fine tuning of parameter values of the model to better match with real structures. In frequency domain approach, the updating can be conducted by solving optimization problems that minimize the difference between experimental and simulated model properties. However, optimization problems in model updating are in general non-convex with an unknown number of local optima. So the question arises how to obtain the global optimum and improve the accuracy of the model updating. This is a question we address in our research. In this work, we propose the branch and band algorithm to solve the non-convex optimization problem in FE model updating. The algorithm basically finds the lower bound and upper bound of the global optimum and to those differences are within a certain tolerance. To apply the B and the B, we also propose the reformulation of the conventional model updating formulation using an epsilon constraint. The key here is that in the conventional form, the generalized eigenvalue equation was considered implicitly at every iteration, but in the proposed approach, we convert it uh, explicitly using epsilon constraint. We verified the proposed approach using 18 day of model and experimental data. We obtained the eigenvalues and eigenvectors from the measurement on 6 DOFs. Here are the results of the proposed approach. The B and V converge to a solution that is guaranteed to be within a certain tolerance from the global optima. Here is the distribution of the updated stiffness parameter. Using the updated stiffness, we simulate the time history response. We can see that the updated model can achieve accurate response compared with initial model. Therefore, we verified that the proposed approach provides reliable model updating results. Hi hey everyone, my name is Cesar Santoyo and I'm presenting our work titled Resource Constraint Tier Pricing for Electric Vehicle Charging. This work was a collaboration with Gustav Nilsson and my advisor, Professor Sam Cook. We study the problem of EV charging in the context of constrained resources. The primary two constrained resources are physical space and uh, total power cons consumption at an EV charging facility. EV charging facility operators are interested in implementing operational models to help them ensure that these resource limits uh, will not be exceeded. One such uh, operational model or pricing models um, where a charging facility operator can obtain uh, provable uh, probabilistic guarantees on 
constrained resources. Now the reason these these uh, statements are probabilistic is because users arrive randomly with a collection of random parameters. Uh, the random parameters being the user's charging demand, their desired time spent at a location, the impatience factor. While at the charging facility, we assume users are rational such that they try to minimize the total costs that they are facing. On the other hand, a, a charging facility is operating on a defined service level model. The station broadcasts a collection of L service level choices to users where each service level has a charging rate, a base energy price, a parking fee, and a total cost based by users. Uh, to dive deeper into the uh, total cost function, we note that the total cost function is comprised of three main parts. Uh, the first part being the charge cost, which is uh, concerned with the energy demand of the user. Second being the opportunity cost, uh, which is concerned how much, with how much time a user spends in excess of their desired time at a charging facility. And lastly, the parking cost, where a, which is concerned with the charging facility uh, trying to discourage users from sticking around after receiving a charge and using up the space that another vehicle may be using. Since users are irrational, they will solve the uh, this minimization um, where they'll choose the service level curse of L that, minima, that is the minimum cost to themselves. Some definitions of interest, N of T is the, num the set of present users and Subscript ACT is a set of actively charging users. And Q of T is the total charge rate of actively charging users. And we have ADA and ADA ACT are the uh, cardinality of each respective set. And we will use these definitions in the following problem statement. So given an EV charging facility operating under the service level model, EV users arriving with random parameters for any M number of users and R total charging facility power consumption rate Compute delta M and gamma R such that the probability that the number of present users at some time T is greater than is less than M will, will be greater than one minus delta M. Uh, similarly, the, we want an expression that lower bounds the probability that the uh, power total power consumption is less than some level R, where these expressions are functions of the uh, capacity limits M and R. So we're interested in finding a closed form expression for these two. Um, if you're interested in the explicit definition of these functions, uh, I invite the uh, viewers to uh, view these two publications, which detail everything in this paper or in this work. So in practice, what does this mean numerically? Um, we ran a Monte Carlo and compared it to the theoretical bounds. The Monte Carlo was used to obtain this probability of, of A to T being less than some value M, which is in purple here with these error bars, these two sigma error bars, and then theoretical bound being here, uh, where we see that numerically it shows that the probability on the number of present users is lower bounded by the theoretical bound. Uh, same thing here uh, for the total active charge rate at the charging facility. Again, if you're interested in further detail of this work, I invite uh, the viewers to please see our man two manuscripts uh, that I previously shared. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Said Chakmak, and I will be presenting Bayesian Optimization of Risk Measures. This is a joint work at Royal Studio, Peter Fraser, and Emily Cho. Let's go back to the beginning of the summer when my colleagues at Cornell University were tasked with designing a COVID-19 testing strategy for bringing students back to campus for the fall semester. They had a simulation model that given a testing strategy X and a set of environmental variables W would predict the disease spread within the campus community. Their goal was to design a testing strategy that was risk averse to these unknown environmental variables. Inspired by this and similar other problems, in this work we study risk averse optimization of the form, minimizing with respect to x a risk measure rho of a function f x w, where w is a random variable with known distribution, f is a continuous black box expensive table eight function, and rho is a risk measure, which is a functional that maps a random variable to a real number, and it offers a middle ground between expectation and the worst case measures. In this work, we study two important risk measures, the value at risk and conditional value at risk. 
Optimizing a risk measure is well understood when f is an inexpensive function with convenient analytical structure. However, when f is expensive to evaluate, derivative free, or is a black box, we do not have many options. In this work, we propose a new knowledge gradient type acquisition function, the rho kg acquisition function, which operates on a Gaussian process model on function f and the implied posterior on the objective. The our acquisition function selects the next x and w to evaluate jointly. At the bottom, we see the value of information plots corresponding to the rho kg and its cheaper approximation. What we see in this, these plots is that these acquisition functions really care about what w we select for any given x, and we have a lot to gain from selecting x and w jointly. Here we have some experiments comparing our acquisition functions with benchmarks from standard Bayesian optimization literature. In gray, we have rho-kg acquisition function. In pink, we have its cheaper approximation. And in brown, we have random sampling that's operating under our statistical model. And random sampling is telling us that there's a lot to gain just by using our statistical model, which captures all the information available on the evolutions of function f. We also see that our oxygen functions are able to match or beat all the benchmarks we consider here using half as many function evolutions. Thank you all for listening and please refer to our paper for more details. This poster presents an on-off learning based scheme to expand the actor's surface while optimally stabilizing an unknown system. We leverage Q-learning techniques to learn optimal strategies with on-off actuation to promote unpredictability of learned behavior against physical plausible attacks. Typically, CPS maintain a stationary framework that may provide an attacker with the time to learn and deploy a low-cost destabilizing attack policy. To counter this threat, moving target defense, a proactive policy aims to dynamically change the attack surface of a CPS. We first define the Q-learning algorithm and an actor-critic framework. The problem formulation goes as follows. We have a linear system and a quadratic cost to minimize. The solution for this optimal control problem is given as follows. To approximate the value function and the optimal gain matrix, we use the following state action utility function Q. Q gives rise to our critic weights WC transpose. These critic weights can be tuned using the critic error as shown above and the critic tuning differential equation as shown below. Similarly, the actor weights which describe the gain matrix can be tuned using the following error and differential equation. To do this, we use data-driven controllability, which is essentially a series of timestamp data while each controller has been shut off. While the superscript actuator has been shut, we take J steps with the given linear system and derive these time series data. We put them together using this summation to derive the data-driven controllability gramian, which must be positive definite for the system to be controllable. Using this idea, we define allowable set of actuators. To switch between an allowable set of actuators out of all possible configurations in the power set eta, the data-driven controllability gramian WDC must be positive definite. Kappa alpha is the set of allowable actuators. The sparse gain matrix is given as follows, where ki semicolon are the rows of the gain matrix, which correspond to the columns of the actor weight matrix that have been zeroed out or have been kept consistent in value, depending on which actuators were present in the allowable set. Finally, tuning the actor errors must be done with the steepest gradients available to the algorithm. The gradient matrix is given as X E sub, subscript A raised to T. And depending on the sparsity level, we define a support matrix T as such, and we use it to update our actor law in this new way. Finally, the resulting hybrid system is shown there. And this main stability theorem of this paper has been stated 
for the reader's convenience. Finally, we want to model adversarial noise and plausible threat models. Adversarial noise during queue learning, if within prescribed bounds, allows the learning agent to still produce policy gains that maintain controllability despite attacks. The gradient of a cumulative state-dependent reward function, Q, yields a physically plausible noise vector, X noise, and then gives us the data-driven version of it using Q hat and Q X U hat. The distance to uncontrollability essentially serves as a notion to guarantee stability and give math to the words prescribed bounds within which our algorithm can still function. The results have been put together in these equations. Finally, simulation results were conducted to validate our proposed theory. To do these, we used the F-16 fighter jet model in the linearized F-16 fighter jet model uh, with the following parameters. And these plots refer to the state ev evolution and the optimal control input evolution given the following switching signal. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a good day. Hi, my name is Tony Lin and I'll be presenting our work today titled Viewpoint Prediction for Camera Pose Estimation. Uh, and this work is done in collaboration with my advisor, Dr. Fu Min Jin. So we're very interested in trying to use monocular vision for our autonomous research platform, the Georgia Tech Miniature Autonomous Blimp, but this is also very applicable for any kind of uh, vehicle that has very low payload capabilities. So monocular vision has several very key benefits. It's very low mass. Um, you can find cameras under five grams. It's very low power. You can find cameras that have um, less than 250 milliamp draw. And um, it requires, it provides very dense information. So these benefits really allow a high fidelity sensing, even for payload vehicle, low payload vehicles uh, that aren't able to carry very much weight. Um, and oftentimes these are done through uh, local base stations that do all the uh, offboarded computation necessary to do um, this kind of high fidelity sensing. So in particular, we're really interested in trying to do this for our Georgia Tech Miniature Autonomous Blimp platform, which really only has a payload capacity of 70 grams, which needs to be shared between uh, propellers, a battery, sensors, and any kind of onboard computation we need locally. So to do monocular vision for localization, there are various other methods that exist in the field. Um, monocular vision for localization is not a new topic by any means, but uh, we're interested in exploring a slightly different problem where given a monocular image, we like to localize our vehicle but we assume that we can access a pose labeled image data set of the environment. So for example, we've um, actually collected a, um, a data set of image label, uh, pose labeled images, which we're calling the GTSR image pose data set uh, of our lab. And it's 144,500 training images and then 36,000 testing images. So shown on screen now are eight samples of these pose labeled images in our data set. And these images are all collected from the onboard camera from our Georgia Tech Miniature Autonomous Blimp. Um, so one simple way to do this without relying on kind of the geometric methods used by visual inertial odometry or uh, through kind of visual slam is to actually try to infer the exact pose of the camera directly from the monocular image itself. And so this would be what we call direct localization through deep learning. Um, so what you would do is just simply collect a data set of images and their associated poses from where those images were taken and try to learn a mapping from those images to poses. Uh, so some other people have done this as well in the past. Um, in particular, one famous example is uh, called PoseNet. But the, symbol, the idea is very, uh, is very straightforward. Just try to use supervised learning to try and estimate the pose directly from the image. And so what's shown on screen, as you can see, is, uh, an on, is a live stream of the true image that we're seeing shown on the right. And then the estimated pose with the 2D projection here. Uh, actually, we're estimating the full three-dimensional pose, but for visualization, it's easier to show in 2D where the blue dot shows the estimate of the true blimp's pose, which is shown in the red dot. So you can see in the center that um, our estimate does reasonably well, actually very well with position error, some, somewhere around 0.3 meters, 0.4 meters. But our actual quaternion error is uh, very bad. And you can see that it actually flips to the opposite side occasionally. So we'd like to try and somehow find a way to improve upon just the simple direct localization approach using deep learning. So we kind of want to ask a question, uh, what if we have access to the alternate mapping from poses to images instead of just images to poses. 
And so we propose a new uh, view prediction particle filter, which is able to leverage such image predictions to try and compute the likelihood of a pose given a camera image. So using a particle filter, we generate a series of a set of possible poses for the camera to be at. And then from each of these poses, we try to predict the image and then use a likelihood function, which is shown on screen, to compare with the true image. And as you can see um, in the simulated result that we're actually able to do reasonably good tracking. Uh, our position estimation is not as good as direct localization, but you can see that the quaternion error is much, much lower. And so we're able to get the alignment and the direction much more, uh, much more efficiently. So finally, what we want to see is how do we combine these two methods together? And so one question we ask now is how does direct localization really relate to the particle filter that we're proposing? And really what's happening is direct localization is providing us a guess of what the maximum likelihood pose is for our view prediction particle filter. So we design what's called a nudging strategy for our particle filter, where we incorporate this maximum likelihood guess as uh, received from the direct localization method. And we add it in as a new particle in the particle filter before we sampling. And what you can see is what happens is that if this maximum likelihood guess is good, then the view prediction particle filter naturally uh, resamples around the direct localization guess. If it's poor, then the view prediction particle filter just completely ignores it. And so you can see in these three, um, error plus shown on the bottom here, that the nudged view, view prediction particle filter does better in position than the view prediction, view prediction particle filter without the direct localization, but also does better in quaternion error than the direct localization alone. Thank you for your time. Hello, we present our work on distributed trajectory optimization for whole body locomotion. The lag robot is arousing more attention because of their abilities to achieve highly dynamic motions, such as jumping or even backflipping, and they can traverse very rough terrains that mobile robots can never reach. Following a hierarchical planning structure, we usually have a task planner as the top layer, a trajectory planner that generates the joint space trajectories, and finally a tracking controller to achieve desired motions. Our work mainly focuses on the trajectory planning level based on trajectory optimization. However, the optimal control problem of underactuated system with high degrees of freedoms commonly suffers from intractable complexity. To address these issues, most existing results use a hierarchical approach. We firstly solve the locomotion problem based on simplified model. They use a whole body model to generate the joint space trajectories. However, this mismatch between simplified and whole body models sometimes can lead to tracking problems and even locomotion failures. Overall, our work centers around the dynamics consensus between the centroidal model and the whole body model to account for full dynamics while still, still maintaining computational efficiency. Starting with the full rigid body dynamics with the floating base, we can use the centroidal model to get an exact mapping from full model to the center mass level. From the equation inside the bottom left block, we can see that the linear and angular momentum can be derived by external forces, center mass position, and contact points. However, as you can see, the model is coupled with the full joint state Q. To simplify the planning complexity, we can get rid of the dependency on the full model by directly optimizing over the center mass position and angular momentum given a pre-specified contact sequence. However, sometimes the angular momentum produced by the lower limbs matters a lot when trying to achieve highly dynamic motions such as running or backflipping. Therefore, it is also important to account for the whole body dynamics, which the simplified model cannot capture. To address this mismatch, we need to firstly formulate the problem. The ultimate objective is to minimize the summation of whole body cost and centroidal cost. The dynamics consensus is achieved by constructing equality constraints between center mass, momentum, and contact forces. In addition, we have some inequality constraints for the joint limit, torque limit, and friction cone. Inspired by the multi-block ADMM, we make the original optimization formulation fitted into the ADM structure. We firstly embed the dynamics inside each model and let unconstrained DDP to handle these dynamics separately. Then we introduce more auxiliary variables, S-bar, U-bar, and lambda-bar to create a projection block 
which is constructed by encoding the inequality constraints inside the indicator functions. In this way, the original optimization problem can be divided into the whole body, centroidal, and the projection block that projects all the related decision variables onto feasible sets. We also proposed a stage-wise accelerated ADMM approach by applying over-relaxation and varying penalty for our multi-block ADMM framework based on the practical performance. We firstly studied a simple car parking problem. The goal is to drive from initial state to a goal state with bounded control inputs. We found that under the same parameters for cost function, the ADMM solver follows a different path with lower cost compared with the control limited DDP. We also validate a better performance of our stage-wise accelerated ADMM approach in terms of convergence rate. In the neat campus gained worker example, we tested our algorithm on both flat and rough terrains to firstly demonstrate a good convergence of all the coupling constraints. Then we demonstrate that with the ADMM iterations growing, the consensus between whole body and centroidal models becomes better and better. Similar to the car parking example, we also show that our stage-wise accelerated ADMM outperforms other variants of ADMM for the torque limit constraint. This also applies to joint limit and friction cone constraints in certain cases. We are currently working on implementing this algorithm for bipedal working robots like Cassie and quadruped robot A1. Stay tuned for more results. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, G and I are going to talk about our work on safe, high-performance autonomous driving using stochastic model predictive control. So first we'll present the results of our method. We're using covariance steering stochastic MPC, which is shown on the right here, and we compare it with two other state-of-the-art optimal control formulations, uh, which are shown here and here. And uh, this is for the auto rally platform. And we conduct 50 uh, Monte Carlo simulations where the car is subjected to a random disturbance. And uh, the goal is to drive around the track at eight meters per second uh, while maintaining the constraints of remaining within the track boundaries. And you can see that the covariance steering stochastic MPC does the best job of rejecting the disturbances in this case, uh, keeping the trajectories all within the track. And it also keeps the uh, velocity, the lateral velocity, and the yaw rate um, all the tightest out of these three, whereas this is a deterministic MPC uh, and it goes outside the track on the corners quite often uh, and also there's a greater spread in the uh, velocities and similarly for model predictive path integral control which is a sampling based controller uh, it also violates these constraints and there's a larger spread in the velocities for these 50 trajectories. Then we will demonstrate uh, an experimental demonstration of the algorithm of covariance steering SMPC on the auto rally platform. So we model the auto rally using the bicycle model along with the friction ellipse and Pajeka magic formulas for the tire road interactions. And then it's also augmented by a learned residual dynamics model. And so this nonlinear model is linearized. Uh, and then for the stochastic linear system, we apply um, an optimal control problem, which is solved in a receding horizon manner uh, following the covariance steering stochastic MPC theory. We propose the covariance controlled model predictive path in the world, or CCM PPI controller. The structure is illustrated in this diagram. The CCM PPI is a sampling based MPC controller which combines covariance steering with MPPI. It minimizes the cost function subject to some nonlinear dynamical constraint and the terminal covariance constraint on the system state. The CCM PPI achieves robust online trajectory planning under fast changing environments. 
We want to compare CCMPPI with MPPI under fast changing environments. In the simulations, we use a single track bicycle model as illustrated by the figure on the left and the equations on the left of this slide. Figures A, B, C, and D shows the simulation results. The green obstacle is set to suddenly appears in front of the traveling vehicle. In figure A, the CCM PPI generates a feasible trajectory that navigates the vehicle to go around the obstacle. While in B, the MPPI controller generates an infeasible trajectory that results in a collision. The reason why this happens is because CCM PPI controller has a flexible trajectory sampling distribution, which enables it to explore more, while the MPPI is not able to adjust its trajectory sampling distribution. And in this case, it is stuck to some local minimum.